Well, several years ago, I was a student ministry pastor in, uh, in Austin, Texas, which means that I spent about five and a half years of my life working with high school and middle school students. And I will never forget, we planned this, uh, this in-town weekend retreat, and we took all of these middle and high school students to this ice skating rink so that we could play broom ball, which is just like an accident waiting to happen. Someone always fractures a wrist when you're trying to run around in ice and just in shoes. Uh, and there was this moment where I was just standing there, uh, I guess watching what was happening, and without realizing it, there was this high school girl that throughout the night had just been accumulating ice. Like she spent a lot of her time just on the ground kind of moving ice together and packing it into uh, a very compact ice ball. And uh, without me realizing it, she reared back with that ice ball and she chunked it at me as I was standing uh, not looking her direction, and she threw that thing as hard as she could, and it smacked me right in the face. And my automatic reflex was to just bend over and cover my face in excruciating pain, because this wasn't a snowball, people. This was an ice-compacted ball. Uh, those things hurt, and so I curled over in pain, and all I could think of that moment was cuss words. Like, those were the only things that filled my mind. Like, I was probably putting cuss words together that don't even naturally go together, but it's what filled my mind. You're like, oh, uh, aren't you a pastor? Hey, I'm a lot godlier now. Now I just Christian cuss in my head, like, oh, my gentle Judas. Like, that's what I would say <laughs> now. I wouldn't say the real things in my head, or I would say, like, mercy, or something really spiritual like that. So we're good now. Don't worry about it. But I was curled over in pain because it was, a, it was unexpected pain. Like there's times where you can brace for pain. Like if you're going wakeboarding or skiing and you hit a jump and you're like, this one's going to hurt. Like you get sideways. It's like, this isn't going to end well. You can brace for it. But this was the type of thing where I wasn't expecting it. So it multiplies the pain. And so I am curled over in pain, only thinking cuss words. And then I look up wanting to say, what the heck were you thinking? And I see on her face just this look like, how is this guy who's like a spiritual role model going to respond to this? And there were, everyone around was watching like, this will be interesting, like getting popcorn, like, oh, a spiritual person having to deal with this. And so in that moment, the only thing that I could do was be like, you know what, it's fine, I'm good, it's not a problem, we're okay. That's what I said, we're okay. We're good, it's fine. And inside, I'm like, it's not fine, I'm not okay, and thank you very much, but that was extremely painful. What were you, th that's what was going on inside, but on the outside, my message was, we're good, I'm fine, it's okay. And as I thought back on that story, I just thought, I wonder if that's been many people's experience with this semester. Like you stepped into this spring 2019 semester and you've gotten smacked by something. Like something has just smacked you right in the face that you didn't expect. Maybe you have had to deal with the traumatic experience of losing a loved one. Maybe you've been rejected by someone or something. Maybe you feel like you have to be perfect, but you're clear that you're, you're not perfect at all. And so you live under this constant pressure to measure up and be enough for people, but you consistently have this tape playing in your mind saying, you're not enough, you don't measure up, you're kind of a failure. And maybe you even have parents who are in some ways, maybe a little bit nicer wording, but that's what they're telling you, you're not enough for me. Maybe an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend, that's a recent development for you, but they have in a sense told you, hey, I just need you to know you're not enough for me. Maybe a friend group has just told you you're not enough for me. Maybe that's what's hit you in the face. Maybe you did something that makes you feel really shameful. Maybe you've gotten, maybe alcohol or drug use has started out as something fun and now it's turned into something that's more of an addiction than anything else. Maybe it's just a cocktail of a bunch of different things this semester. Your grades are struggling, you don't like how you look, you don't know 
what you want to do with you, your life, you lack purpose, your living situation is miserable, your friendships are mediocre, and it seems like everyone is having the time of their life except you. Maybe you can't put your finger on it, you just know that you feel down. Maybe you've gotten smacked in the face by something, and when you walk across campus and we all ask the question, hey, what's up, how's it going? The only answer to that question is, I'm good. I'm fine. Like, nobody's real. It's like, oh, thank you so much for asking. I'm depressed out of my ever-loving mind. I struggled to get out of bed this morning. No, we walk around just like me on that ice skating rink. I'm good. I'm fine. Everything's okay. But inside, you know, I'm not fine. Things aren't good, and I'm not okay. Statistics would say that that is probably the reality for many people in this room. The 2018 National College Health Assessment revealed that 69.4% of college students reported feeling very sad at some point during the previous 12 months. 42.7% of college students reported feeling so depressed that it was difficult to function sometime in the last 12 months. 62% felt overwhelming anxiety in the last 12 months, and 12.7% seriously considered suicide at some point in the past 12 months. This is why we're in the midst of a four-week series that we're calling Smiling Depression, and it's just a series about when life is not okay. And this is a place where it's okay to not be okay, but we love you enough to challenge you and encourage you, and we want to point you towards hope and healing and peace and joy. And so that's why you need to be here for every week of the semester, especially if you're struggling, because we want to help you in some way turn the corner. And the, the way that we've been doing that is that we've been looking at the life of Job. Each week of the series, we're just looking at a snapshot of his life. And by looking at his life, we will be able to navigate our way towards more peace, more hope, and more joy. I want you to know, tonight will be a heavy talk, but I want you to know that this is a talk that I probably needed to hear when I was sitting just right over there when I was in college, attending Breakaway. And this is probably a message that I need to hear now. Like, I've told you guys this before, but my personality leans towards anxiety and feeling down. I'm an Enneagram 4, so melancholy is kind of my thing. And so my personality leans in the direction of anxiety and depression. So I tell you that just to say, hey, we're all in this together. And we're going to move towards hope, joy, and peace together. So if you have a Bible, I want, you to, I want to invite you to turn with me tonight to Job chapter 3. Job chapter 3 is where we're going to be. And I told you last week that there's no way we're going to look at all the book of Job. I think it took John Calvin about 159 sermons to get through the book. We've got four weeks, so we're just doing snapshots. But if you were here last week, we got introduced to this guy, Job. Job had a lot going for him. He was probably one of the most spiritual persons, godly people in the land. He was definitely one of the richest people in the place where he lived. And in one day, he loses everything. He loses all of his wealth, he loses all of his employees, and he loses all of his children in just one day. That's in Job chapter one. And then Job chapter two, which is a chapter we won't read for the sake of time, but you need to know, he loses his health. And so Job goes from having everything to having nothing. Like, he didn't get hit by an ice ball. He got hit by an ice boulder, just smacked his life. And so now we get to Job chapter 3, which is basically this song that Job wrote about how he was feeling about his circumstances. So if you left last week and you were like, okay, Job's life is unrealistic because he loses everything and he's just like, well, it's all good. No, you need, to, you need to read Job chapter 3, because in Job chapter 3, he's just really honest, and he kind of writes this song, and I love that, because songs a lot of times play the soundtracks to our lives, and a lot of times the music that we listen to represents what we are actually feeling inside. And so I'm going to read the whole chapter, and I just want you to, to listen along to Job's song. It's pretty depressing, just 
so you know. But Job says this. It says, after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job said, let the day perish on which I was born. And the night that said a man is conceived, let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. That night, let thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Behold, let that night be barren. Let no joyful cry enter it. Let those curse it who curse the day, who are ready to rouse up Leviathan. Let the stars of its dawn be dark. Let it hope for light, but have none. Nor see the eyelids of the morning, because it did not shut the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth, come out from the womb, and expire? Why did the knees receive me, or why the breast that I should nurse? For then I would have lain down and been quiet. I would have slept. Then I would have been at rest with kings and counselors of the earth who rebuilt ruins for themselves, or with princes who had gold, or who filled their houses with silver, or why was I not as a hidden stillborn child, as infants who never see the light? There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. There the prisoners are at ease together. They hear not the voice of the taskmaster. The small and the great are there, and the slave is free from his master. Why is light given to him who is in misery in life to the bitter in soul, who long for death, but it comes not, and dig for it more than for hidden treasures, who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? For my sighing comes instead of my bread, and my groanings are poured out like water. For the thing that I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. I love this. I love that this chapter is in the Bible because the Bible doesn't sugarcoat anything. This is one of God's people. And what's his message? We're not gonna spend time going line for line through this song because we don't need to. We don't need to sit there and pick apart poetry, the message of his song is very simple. In verses one through 10, what's his point? His point is, I wish I hadn't been born. In verses 11 through 19, what's he simply saying? He's saying being dead is better than being alive. And then in verses 20 through 26, he's simply saying, I wish I were dead. This is Job just saying, you know what? I am not okay. I mean, look again at how he ended verse Ended the chapter, verse 26, he says, I'm not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. What Job is showing us is that these types of feelings are possible. They are a possible part of human experience. It is possible to go through life and experience deep darkness. It's possible to feel down. It's possible to feel depressed. It's even possible to feel suicidal. That's what he is showing us. So I just want to ask, by show of hands, this might take some courage, but I just want to ask if anyone in here is just willing to be honest, whether you, where, if you find yourself somewhere on that spectrum, it might just be like, I had a bad day. Not everything is okay. Or you might be sitting there saying, you know what? I feel down down a lot of the time, or maybe you're saying, I think I'm depressed, or some of y'all might say I'm suicidal. Is anyone just willing to raise your hand and say, you know what, everything's not okay, everything's not fine. Yeah, a lot of hands are going up. Thanks for your honesty. So many people in this room are just here saying, I'm not okay. And I hope that you can look around and see you're not in this alone. You're not the only one feeling that way. And so here's my hope. My hope is that we could all come together tonight and move together collectively towards hope, towards peace, towards joy. Here's what I need you to know. This isn't gonna be a normal talk. Usually at Breakaway, we just open up a passage and we just try and move through it verse by verse. Tonight, I just wanna get really practical with you guys. And I just wanna shoot you straight. And I wanna invite you to consider four choices that you might need to make in order to move towards wholeness. 
four different choices. Some of you guys are going to leave here and be like, okay, I need to make two of those choices. Others of you are going to leave and you're going to be like, okay, I need to make all four of those choices. But these four choices, I promise you, will have everything to do with you moving towards joy, moving towards peace, and moving towards hope. The first choice that I want to encourage you to make is this. Choose to tell someone. Choose to tell someone that you're not okay, that you're not fine, that life isn't that great. Here's what you need to realize. Being alone and handling things on your own when you are down or depressed is what feels most natural. Like handling things on your own, doing things on your own, trying to deal with your circumstances in isolation is what will feel most natural. But you also need to know that it is the most unhealthy, unproductive, unproductive and unbiblical option. So I just wanna encourage you to tell someone that not everything is okay. Listen to what King Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter four. King Solomon was possibly the smartest person to ever walk the face of the earth besides Jesus Christ, the wisest person at least besides Jesus. And here's what he says in Ecclesiastes four verses nine through 12. He says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Now watch this. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm but how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying life can get really cold sometimes. Life can be extremely cold. Loved ones do pass away. Breakups do happen. Rejection is a thing. Life can be extremely cold, and our tendency is to want to withdraw and go somewhere and shiver on our own. But did you see the rhetorical question that he asked? He said this, if two lie together, they keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? He's saying to try and keep warm on your own is unproductive, it's unfruitful, it's unbiblical, it is unhealthy. Because what you need to realize is that often God uses his people to warm up his people. And so I just wanna beg you, for the sake of your joy, to just find someone tonight and just say, I just need to be honest with you, I'm just not that okay. Like my life just isn't that fine right now. See, what I need you to realize is it takes a stronger person to admit that everything is not okay than to pretend like everything is when it isn't. It takes a much stronger person to admit that not everything is okay. I love what happened with my nine-year-old son, Noah, just a couple days ago. He, he stepped into my home office and he was just like, Dad, and I was like, yeah, what's up, dude? He's like, I, um, something is just re- has been upsetting me all day and I don't even know what that is. Like, I didn't ask him. I was like, hey, dude, everything okay? No, he just sought me out. And he's like, Dad, something has been upsetting me all day, and I don't even know what that is. And I was like, man, I love that type of courage. There's something in him that realizes I don't need to try and figure this out on my own. It actually will be healthier for me to expose how I'm feeling right now. And what it did was it gave me an opportunity to sit there and help him process. I was like, hey, dude, with your cousins in town this weekend, did anything happen that really bothered you? He's like, no. I was like, well, man, did you have a bad dream last night? He was like, no. And then as we were processing and I was asking him questions, something clicked. He was like, you know what? I saw something on a movie that just kind of scared me. And what it allowed me to do was it allowed me to sit and process with them. And then Kat and I, we were able to look and be like, he's exhausted. He didn't get much sleep. He was partying with his cousins all weekend and he's just exhausted. So it just makes sense, but we were able to come around him and encourage him, and now he doesn't even think about that just a few days later, and he is moved back towards joy and peace. So you need some people in your life that you can just be like, I'm not okay, and they can step in and say, well, what's going on? Well, I don't know what's going on. Okay, well, has something happened? 
Is there something that's stressing you out right now? Is everything okay with your parents? Is everything okay with your dating relationship? Is there something specific going on? And you can kind of dial it in. And just knowing that someone else knows, knowing that someone else cares, it just breathes life. It's light in darkness. And it brings hope. I beg you, choose to tell someone tonight. Second choice that you need to make is this. Choose to fight for your health. Choose to fight for your health. Here's what you need to realize. When you're feeling down, the last thing you're gonna wanna do is anything. When you're feeling down or if you've moved towards depression or if you're feeling suicidal, the last thing that you're gonna wanna do is anything. And so I just wanna beg you to choose to fight for your emotional health and your relational health and your mental health and your physical health and your spiritual health. These are things that you need to go to battle for. You need to fight for these things. And so a different way for me to phrase it is discipline yourself. Exercise certain disciplines. If there aren't certain disciplines in your life while you're down, put some in place to fight for your health. So let me just rattle off Several things that I would encourage you to do. Number one, I encourage you, if you're feeling down, press into the Lord. Your quiet times don't have to be these extravagant times where you put all this pressure on yourself to be as godly as possible. I just want to encourage you, read one psalm a day. Read one psalm a day. The Psalms, the book of Psalms is just a collection of songs. And so I just encourage you to read one a day and look for the Psalms to give you a song to sing to God. And if you read one and nothing speaks to you, read the next one, they're short enough, and just wait till something resonates with your heart and then make that your song to God. If you read about David asking God for help, then you make that your song and you ask God for help. If you're feeling down and you can't sleep, when David talks about lying down in peace and you make that your song. God, let me just lie down in peace. Let me, let me rest, let me sleep well tonight. You make that your song and then pray, just pray. Ask God, invite him into your circumstances. Press into him through his word and through prayer. I encourage you to start journaling and let's just be clear, I'm not talking about a diary. No dudes in here need to be like, dear diary, today was okay. Okay, see you tomorrow. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just an honest book where you even ask God, God, I don't like to write, but God, would you just open up the joy of journaling to me? I remember when I hit rock bottom in my life, just fresh out of college, God just opened up the joy of journaling, and what I did is each night I would just sit there and I'd pour out all of my feelings into this journal. You know what it did is it got what was inside on the outside, and it was an opportunity for me to process Instead of stuffing things and just ignoring things, I was forced to process them and get them out of myself. I encourage you to practice gratitude. Practice gratitude. What does 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 say? It says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In everything, give thanks. I I. I believe that gratitude is like the lighter fluid of faith. If you wanna see your relationship with God kind of flare up, then just be grateful. Discipline yourself each day to just, before you go to bed, just think of three things that you can say thank you for. Because when you discipline yourself to say thanks, you know what, you begin to see the good in your life. Even in the midst of the tough times, you begin to see rays of hope and sunlight in your life. Discipline yourself for gratitude. Sleep, get it. The National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute says this, studies show that sleep deficiency alters activity in some parts of the brain. If you're sleep deficient, you may have trouble making decisions, solving problems, controlling your emotions and behavior, and coping with change. Anyone struggling to control your emotions right now? Anyone having trouble making decisions? It might be because you need sleep. The Mental Health Foundation said that people who don't get enough sleep were four times as likely to suffer from lack of concentration, have relationship problems, they're three times more likely to be depressed, and 2.6 times more likely to commit suicide. 
According to the American Sleep Association, adults, and you are an adult, you, you know how much sleep you need each night? You need between seven and nine hours. Some of y'all are like, in a week? No, a night. <laughs> you need to go to sleep. I mean, look at Jesus. He got tired. What did he do? He took a nap on a boat. Jesus slept too. Some of y'all might need to go get off social media just so that you can go to bed at night. I got off social media a few weeks ago. It has been liberating. I don't miss it at all. Some of you need to just learn the power of saying no. And I know FOMO is a real thing, but you know what? It might be okay to miss out sometimes for the sake of your health. I remember in college, my college pastor, Brian Fisher, said it's possible that the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. Some of y'all need to sleep. Some of y'all need to exercise, like just get blood moving, get outside, let sunlight hit your skin, go for a walk with God. Eat, don't eat your feelings. Care about what you eat, make sure you're eating enough. And then don't sit there and, and pacify your pain with food. In the end, you'll just feel worse. And some of y'all might need to simplify, like simplify your schedule. You know what? Fulfill your commitments this semester. But now is the time in the semester where you're starting to look ahead to what you'll be involved in next semester. If you're redlining this semester, you probably need to dial it back next semester. Figure out the the few things you must do, because you can do a lot of things, but there's just a couple things that you must do. Seek the Lord and simplify. The third choice I want to encourage you to make is this. Go, choose to go see a medical professional. Now we're kind of moving up the spectrum. The first two options are really for those who are just kind of feeling down. Maybe you've just had a rough Weak, And so I just want to encourage you, you know what? Choose to tell someone. Choose to fight for your health. And some of you guys, though, are hearing everything I just said about choosing to fight for your health. And you're like, uh, I can't do anything that you just said. Like even getting here tonight felt like climbing a mountain. Like if you are honest, life consistently feels like you are trying to climb a mountain, yet you're always at the bottom of it. And so if that's you, I just want to tell you that it's possible that you need to go see a doctor. And you need to begin to identify the symptoms of depression. Let me just rattle them off for you. Here are the symptoms of depression. Consistent low mood, meaning you feel low, sad, or empty most days. Diminished interest or pleasure in most or all activities. Significant changes in appetite. You either eat too much or too little and you're experiencing rapid weight loss or rapid weight gain. Sleep disturbance. Either you can't sleep or stay asleep or you sleep too much. Low energy and motivation. You consistently struggle to get going and you feel fatigued. You battle feelings of worthlessness or excessive guilt. You have difficulty concentrating and making decisions or you even have recurring thoughts of death. If you've been exhibiting multiple symptoms for more than two weeks, I wanna strongly encourage you to go talk to a doctor because here's what I need you to realize. It's possible that there isn't just a spiritual problem or an emotional problem. There could be a physiological problem like your brain and your body might not be functioning how they're supposed to function. See, our tendency as Christians is to spiritualize everything. And everything is spiritual in some ways. But we look at depression and we're like, it is just a spiritual problem. And that is not true. And you can email me and you can disagree with me. I honestly don't care and I won't respond because what it shows is a lack of understanding of what really can happen in your body. And so I learned this years ago. I had been feeling down for a period of time and so I went and I saw my primary care physician who was a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. Like I would sit in his doctor's office and it would be like a devotional. I'd walk out of there and be like, yeah, let's get Jesus. Like, this is awesome. Like, that's the kind of doctor he was. It'd be like, I want to be like him when I grow up, even though I am an adult. <laughs> and I remember just telling him what was going on. And I, I walked in there. I was like, man, I don't want to take medication. 
Like, I'm a pastor, this is a spiritual issue. And he just, he just lovingly was like, T.A., you need to realize that it is a spiritual issue. There is a spiritual component to things, but there's also a physiological component to things. And you need to understand that sometimes the body and the mind, the brain doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And so I began to take medication, and he was clear with me. He's like, medication doesn't fix your problem. We're not copping out of things. But if life feels like you're climbing a mountain, what medication will do will just make the mountain smaller, and it will get you a little further up the mountain. But T.A., you better be seeking the Lord. You better be praying. You better be reading your word. But medication is simply going to help some things happen in your body so that you can begin to handle life. And so let me just tell you, some of you guys just need to go see a medical professional and just tell them what's going on. Because what you need to realize is sometimes medication prescribed by the hands of wise, experienced, and discerning medical professionals can actually be a gift from God. The fourth choice that some of y'all need to consider tonight is to choose to live another day. That's where some of you guys are tonight. And that's a decision that Job had to make himself. Listen to what happens back in chapter two. After he loses his health, here's what his wife says. Verse nine, then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. She's basically saying, just curse God so he'll take you out. It's kind of spiritual suicide. And what does Job say? He said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Then verse chapter three, verses 20 and 21, just remember what it says. He says, why is light given to him who is in misery and life to the bitter in soul who long for death, but it comes not and dig for it more than for hidden treasures. You know what he's saying? He's saying, if I could die, I would, but God hasn't given me that luxury. And he chose to live another day. See what Job realized is that suicide was an illegitimate way of dealing with legitimate pain and despair. But there's some of you here in the room tonight who are viewing suicide as a legitimate way of dealing with legitimate pain and despair. And that's actually a trend in our country right now. In America, someone attempts suicide once every minute. Someone completes a suicide in the US every 17 minutes. Worldwide, about 2,000 people commit suicide each day. In the past 50 years, suicide rates for those between 15 and 24 have increased by over 200%. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among college students after traffic accidents. 12 people between the ages of 15 and 24 commit suicide every day. That's about one every two hours. There's 1,100 suicides at colleges each year. One in 12 have made a suicide plan at some point. I did a talk solely on suicide back in the fall of 2017. If you're struggling with suicide, I wanna encourage you to go back and listen to that message. It's just titled Suicide. But I gave that message on a Tuesday night and then that Friday or Saturday night, I was one of the judges at Songfest and I sat next to the woman who's in charge of the Texas A&M Student Counseling Hotline. And we began to talk and she, she, was, she was over the, the hotline that you guys can call if you're feeling suicidal. And I just asked her, I said, how often do y'all receive phone calls? And she just looked at me and she was like, every day, every day. And that changed the way that I saw campus. I would drop my kids off at school in the morning and I'd be driving down university watching you guys cross the street. And I just began to look at y'all and think, I wonder if it's, I wonder if, One of these students is someone who will call that hotline today. I wonder if one of these students is actually contemplating taking their life today. And that's where some of y'all are. There are people in this room who are like, you know what? 
I have considered taking my life today. I would like to end it. That's actually, it seems like a legitimate option. So if that's you, if you're in here tonight and you're feeling that way, can I just speak into your life and say, it's not an accident that God brought you here tonight? that God in his loving kindness for you, in his deep desire to know you more intimately has brought you into this place as in some ways a lifeline from a friend just telling you that he loves you, he cares about you, and he does not want you to die. And so here's what I wanna do. I just wanna remind you of three things. There's three things that you need to know tonight so that you can choose to live another day. And if you have a friend that just might be on the brink of suicide, I encourage you to write these down so that you can encourage them. The first thing I wanna remind you of is this. God wants you to live and so do I. God wants you to live and so do I. Remember what David says in Psalm 139, verse 16. He says, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were, were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, God determined your birth date. God determined your expiration date. Do not try and play God in your own life. God has mapped out your life. If he didn't want you here, you would have stopped breathing a long time ago. God wants you to live. If you don't believe me, just look at Jesus Christ. What does Jesus say in John 10, 10? He says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is saying, the reason that I left heaven and came to earth was so that you could have life. Death, stealing, killing, destroying, that belongs to the enemy. But Jesus is saying, I came that you might have life. The message of the gospel, the message of Christianity is this, Jesus Christ died so that you could live. That is the message. Jesus left heaven and came to earth. He lived the life that we couldn't. He died the death that we deserve to die. Why? So that we could taste eternal life now and forevermore. Jesus died so that we could live. This is the message of Christianity. God wants you to know. He wants you to live, but I want you to be clear. God wants you to live and so do I. And the reason that I tagged that last part on there is that some of you just need to hear from a, from a person that you're cared for. I just wanna lovingly tell you, I don't need to know your name to know that I would do anything for you so that you could live. I want you to live. So I will stay here till the wee hours of the morning talking with you if I need to. If I need to drive you to the hospital tonight, I will do it but I want you to live. You know what the crazy thing is? Nearly half of those considering suicide don't tell anyone. But here's what you need to realize. The difficult thing is this. People don't tell anyone because they don't think anyone cares, but you won't know how many people care until you actually tell someone. I think about just last week before breakaway, on the Monday before last breakaway, I got on... Um, to my uh, high school Facebook page to, because my reunion is coming up and I was scrolling through and I saw that one of my classmates had committed suicide. And this is a guy that I haven't talked to in 20 years. But I was nauseous for the rest of that night and all the next Tuesday. And even when I think about now, it, it, it like hits me deep in my soul because if only I had known, and I didn't even know this guy that well. but I would have done anything to step into his life, to just breathe hope into his life. I tell you that just to say, people who don't even know you that well would bend over backwards and lay their lives down for the sake of your life. So don't buy into the lie that no one cares because God wants you to live and so do I. The second thing that I want you to remember is this, the end of your pain is the beginning of someone else's. The end of your pain is the beginning of someone else's. Let me just, will you look me in the eyes and let me just speak this to you. No one's life will be better off with you gone. No one's life will be better off with you gone. I assure you of that. You know, sometimes we have this thought like, part of us wants to die just to see who would come to our funeral. 
And I don't even know that, that that's an option in the afterlife. Like I don't, I can't point to somewhere in the Bible that that would even be an option. But just hypothetically, let's say that God allowed you to see your funeral. I think you'd be shocked by two things. Number one, I think you'd be shocked by the amount of people who came, just showing that they care about you. But I think you'd be even more shocked to see the amount of pain that your choice caused to so many people. And we don't even realize that. But let me just speak to you as a father and as a pastor. I've had to officiate two suicide funerals. One of them was for one of your classmates right before this school year began. The other was for a high school student. And I've had to look moms and dads in the eyes who have lost all hope. And I've seen in their eyes the question and the despair of like, what happened? What, what happened? And I've seen other family and friends flood into funerals, devastated by someone's choice. And so I just tell you that because you need to hear from a, from a real person that you are cared for and you are loved, but you need to know that your choice to end your life would cause devastation to so many people. Your pain, the end of your pain, will be the beginning of someone else's. It's interesting, if you were to go and read people's suicide notes, like celebrities' suicide notes are posted online, a lot of times people end their notes, it's not your fault and I love you so much. That's what people want others to know. Hey, I love you so much. Do you realize that that is absolutely, hands down, without a doubt, the worst way to tell someone that you love them? That message deserves a lifetime of explanation and display. Some of you guys hear that the end of your pain is the beginning of someone else's, and I just want to shoot you straight. Some of you guys hear that, and you're like, good. Like you want someone to feel pain because someone has caused pain to you, and they've inflicted deep emotional or physical pain in your life, and something in you wants to commit suicide to get them back. I just need you to be clear that your choice to commit suicide is not a DM. It's not a direct message. It's the final post on your story, and everyone has to see it, and everyone has to deal with it. In your desire to punish one person, you will punish so many more. The last thing that I want you to remember is this. What you feel today will not be what you feel forever. What you feel today will not be what you feel forever. Your life is more than this moment. Dying might feel better than this moment, but you need to know that the book of your life isn't just one page long, and it's not just one chapter long. Pages turn, chapters end, new ones begin. What you feel now will not be what you feel forever. I can't promise you that a, a day of just complete happiness and joy is awaiting you in this life, but I can tell you that on a scale of one to 10, one being I wanna take my life, 10 being I love my life, you know what? A two is better than a one. And a five is better than a three. And you have a God who loves to move you up the scale. I need you to realize suicide is often an impulsive, yet permanent and irreversible attempt to deal with unbearable, yet temporary pain. What you feel today will not be what you feel forever. I just want to share a piece of a story from, from one of you guys, someone in this room who has shared his story with me. There was a season uh, for him in college where um, just a lot of things happened in a short amount of time. Things went south in a romantic relationship, and there was a lot of stress and anxiety that was happening with school, and there was also just some painful things that happened in his life in a very short amount of time. And as he shared his story with me, I just wanna share what he wrote. He said this, 
And it has everything to do with everything I've been talking about tonight. He said this, I was contemplating suicide a lot. Thoughts like, what if I went to the top of my dorm? What if I just got into my car and drive somewhere? What if I went to the Galveston Causeway? I felt like the world was better off without me. I felt like God filled me with hope only to abandon me and take all that hope away. And I was angry, upset, and suicidal because of it. This is the most painful period of my life. I wanted to end my pain by taking my life, but my selflessness kicked in. I thought of my family who cares for me so much, and I didn't tell them anything about what was going on. The word devastating would be a vast understatement for them. I thought of God. I knew that this was his plan, and it is for my benefit. This was difficult to believe, but I must trust him that he's teaching me something even through this pain. Do you see what I'm talking about? God wanted him to live. And others did it as well. He realized that God wanted him to live. He realized that the end of his pain would be the beginning of other people's pain. And he began to trust in faith that what he felt in that moment wouldn't be what he felt for forever. And so his story continued, and here's what he wrote. He said, since being in College Station, things have been better. I've been rebuilding myself from the pieces that Galveston left me in, establishing new friends, new church, continued counseling and schoolwork. Things aren't perfect, but I'm going in the right direction. You know why I chose this story? Because it isn't this tied in a bow, perfect ending. He's not saying, you know what, I was depressed and suicidal. Now I never think about that. I'm not depressed at all. I don't struggle at all. My life is perfect on a scale of one to 10. It's a 10, it's always a 10. Life is great. Nothing is imperfect in my life. Know what he's saying? He's, he's just saying, you know what, it's better. It's not perfect. But I'm heading in the right direction. Like I was a one, now I'm a three. I was a two, now I'm a five. And a five is better than a two, a three is better than a one. And he's trusting God in faith. He's chosen to tell someone. Now he's sharing his story of depression with others in hopes of helping others. He's choosing to fight for his health. He's putting disciplines in, in place so that he can pursue health. He chose to seek out a medical professional. He's seeing a counselor. And he's made the choice to live another day. I'll end just by pointing you to Jesus. Jesus knows where you've been. On the night that Jesus would be betrayed, arrested, and then later the next day crucified, Jesus found himself in a garden, praying to his father. And here's what he said. Matthew 26, verse 38 says this. Jesus said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. That's what he told his friends. He said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He's been where you are now. Jesus has seen suicide as an option, but you know what he ends up praying? in the garden to his father, he says, not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. Would you step out in faith tonight? Would you be willing to say that same prayer? You know what, God, not my will, but your will be done. Ultimately, Jesus' choice to say, not my will, but your will be done, led him to the cross. It led him to death, but he died so that you could live. So would you just trust that and lean into that and believe that your God in heaven sees you and loves you and is fighting for you and will come alongside you and provide for you, but it's it's gonna require you to make a choice. Will you choose to tell someone? Will you choose to fight for your health? Will you choose to maybe go see a medical professional? Will you choose to live another day? I pray that you will.